Hello and welcome everyone to our live stream on new treatments for severe asthma and managing allergy triggers. I'm Ed Bottomley with the Michigan Medicine Department of Communication and today we're going to be talking about severe asthma, including how it is diagnosed and managed and also how allergies may play into asthma. Today's panelists include Dr. Njira Lagogo, Associate Professor in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine and Director of the Asthma Program. We also have Dr. Anna Kowalski, Clinical Associate Professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology. And finally, we have Latasha Phelan Wright, who's here to talk about her experience as a patient with severe asthma. Now, before we start, just a few housekeeping items. You can submit questions at any time for our panel to answer during the Q&A portion of today's chat. Questions can be submitted by commenting on this video, but please note that your name or profile name will be visible to others participating. So if you prefer a more anonymous option, you can also send us a private message via the social media channel you're watching on. If you can't stay for the whole chat, or want to share the recording with a friend, a video of the chat in its entirety will be available on our Michigan Medicine YouTube channel as well. So let's kick things off with a question, a couple of questions actually for you, Latasha. If you could share your story with us, how did you find out you had severe asthma? Hi, my name is Latasha. I found out I had severe asthma in the year of 2004. In 2004, I was diagnosed with um, allergies, quite severe allergies. And when I went to my regular PCP doctor, they told me I had an allergy infection. So they gave me sprays for my nose and they told me I had an upper respiratory infection. They gave me medication for that. I wasn't getting any better. They were trying to take care of me. Then they referred me to a pulmonologist. I went to the pulmonologist. I was wheezing. They started me on breathing treatments right there in the office. They started me on steroids also. As time progressed, I still wasn't getting any better. And so throughout the years, I was continue on different steroids, different asthma medications, prednisones, until I was able to get to Dr. Lagogo, which was really great because the pulmonologist that I was seeing could not no longer handle my case. It was just too confusing for them. I had been in um, the hospital. I've been in ICU within the last two years, seven times. I've been bipap I'm. I've been on so many different asthma medications. If you name it, they've tried it. Once I got in touch with Dr. Gogo, she took force right on my case. She knew exactly how to handle it. She started me on biologics. She also got me on a regimen to get my asthma under control, which was really, really great because asthma is very, very tricky. Sometimes you feel that you can handle it yourself. You would say, okay, you know, I'll use my inhaler. I'll use my nebulizer. And you would think it's controlled when it's really not controlled. Thank you. Thank you for, for that, Latasha. Um, I see you, you nodding there, uh, Dr. Legogo, in the background. Latasha, what would you describe your, your journey as being like from, from, from the start right to where you are now? I would say my journey has been truly, truly stressful. It's not been a good journey at all. Now it's much better. I see the light at the end of the tunnel because from the beginning, like I say, you know, I've been in an ICU. I've been hospitalized so many times. Doctors have always wanted to intubate me. Instead of intubate, I always refuse. I've been BiPAP. I've been to the emergency room so many times. And when I go to the hospital, a lot of times you have to be your own advocate. But sometimes your asthma is so inflamed and you're having a hard time talking. And you'll go into the ER room and sometimes they'll think that you look fine. And they'll go by looks, not knowing your condition. And so once they listen to you, they'll say, oh, I don't hear any airflow and get right on it at that point. But sometimes on our own, we think that we have more time than we have. And we really don't. You know, a lot of times I drove myself to the hospital and they're telling me, don't ever do that. You need to call 911. You know, when they check your oxygen level, it's like you needed immediate care. And once I got, like I said, when I got in touch with Dr. Gogo, my pulmonologist that I had previous had told me that she was a great pulmonologist and this is the one that I needed to see. 
I've, I have not been in ICU since I've seen Dr. Lugogo, since she's been managing my care. Thank you. I, th I think that's really a, a fantastic background. I think all the information in there was so valuable. You know, I saw I saw our doctors nodding almost at, at every sentence that you were saying there. So thank you for sharing that. And I think that's really the perfect way to kick this off. Um, let's move on to a pretty basic question, but a, a really important one when we start this off for, for Dr. Lugogo. What is severe asthma? sorry, asthma, and what are the signs and symptoms? So, um, you know, when you have asthma, it can be um, all the way from mild to severe. Frankly, um, I'm a little bit hesitant to call asthma mild because even mild patients can suffer fatal events. And a lot of times when they are told they're mild, they sort of um, feel comforted by that idea and they don't really take it very seriously. So um, we really need to think of asthma as a condition that's either very active or not very active at different times. On the severe end of the spectrum, the patients have a lot of symptoms. They have daily symptoms. They are waking up at night. They are short of breath. They are coughing. They are wheezing. They are requiring a lot of medications keep their asthma in control or they are uncontrolled despite being on a lot of medications. And so, um, you know, the most severe presentations of asthma really have very dominant symptoms, but I want everyone to understand that once you have asthma, you should be pretty serious about it and making sure it's controlled regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, because it is a serious condition that requires attention. Thank you. You know, I, I almost feel like that, that bears repeating there, Dr. Gogo, Dr. Lugogo. You said at the beginning, mild is something that you kind of stay away from that word. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you for, the, for that. The next question that we have up, how is asthma diagnosed? You have to um, get a couple of things done to uh, decide if you have asthma. So one, we look for symptoms that are consistent with the diagnosis. And two, we try to make sure you don't have any other alternative diagnosis that might be giving you the symptoms that you have. Three, we measure your lung function to see how well air gets out of your lungs because asthma is a condition where your bronchial tubes, which bring air in and out of the lungs, become tight and narrowed and you have trouble getting air out of your lungs. So there is some testing done there. And more recently, we've really become a little smarter about how we think of asthma because we now know that not all asthma is created equally. It's not the same in each presentation. So now we do something called phenotyping. We want to know, do you have allergies driving your asthma? In which case I would collaborate with Dr. Kowalski on figuring out how to control your allergies. Or do you have eosinophils that are driving your asthma? That's a type of white blood cell that can make asthma worse. Or do you have a high nitric oxide level, which is a test we can do in the clinic. You just blow into a little machine and it measures inflammation in the lungs. Knowing your type of asthma is critical because if we are gonna use biologic drugs to treat you, we need to understand what's driving a particular patient's asthma. So it's a, it's a composite of all of those things together that helps us to confirm the diagnosis in an individual patient. My next question for you, Dr. Lagogo, how dangerous is severe asthma? Can you die from severe asthma? Unfortunately, you can die of any kind of asthma. And in fact, if you look at people who passed away from asthma or who presented to the hospital with what we call near fatal asthma, meaning they ended up in ICU on life support because of asthma, but they survived. If you look at that kind of a patient and you look back three months, there are about 30% of those patients had no symptoms three months before this event occurred. And so there is a risk of dying from asthma regardless of whether it's mild or severe. In fact, I think the severe patients are a little bit more aware of their disease. They are more connected. They are being seen more regularly. And so they are plugged into care a little bit more, which reduces their risk of having these severe events and, and dying of asthma. But asthma is a disease, unfortunately, in the state of Michigan, 
that leads to the death of uh, between 100 and 120 people per year. So it is a serious condition that we need to pay close attention to. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kowalski, Latasha mentioned being told she had allergies at first. What role do allergists have in the treatment of asthma? So um, a lot of patients who have asthma have underlying what's called uh, type two inflammation. Type two inflammation is considered allergic inflammation. So asthma often doesn't exist on its own. It, it exists with allergic rhinitis, which is um, the typical seasonal allergy symptoms that people get or around pets. Um, it exists with eczema, which affects the skin. It can exist with food allergies also. And so um, in, in, in what uh, Dr. Hugovo mentioned about the biologic agents, um, it's really important to get a sense of what type of asthma a person has because what they're going to get better with is dependent on what they actually have underlying it. So um, in children, for example, children who have uh, uh, nasal allergies have a higher risk of developing asthma. And if they are exposed to things that they're allergic to on a regular basis, such as pets or cockroach in the home or rodents or dust mites, anything that has uh, a potential or mold that has potential um, allergy driving capability, um, they will develop asthma more often um, if they have that underlying uh, process. And so um, mitigating those things um, is really important to actually help control the asthma. Um, knowing what they are is important. Um, and that's where allergists come into play um, when treating asthma. Um, so uh, the underlying allergies have to be elucidated and then potentially helped. Thank you. And we, we have another uh, allergy question. People talk about the trifecta of asthma, allergies and eczema. Why are these things connected? So um, the underlying process is that you have a propensity or the person has a propensity for developing allergies in the first place. And that's often driven by genetics, um, by family history, but it can also be driven by what they're exposed to. So if they're exposed to many things which can potentially increase the rate of, of allergic inflammation, such as car exhaust fumes or factories, so pollution is one, for example, that, that has been shown to increase the rate of allergies. Um, then the person, once they develop one type, so, so let, okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you an example. <laughs> so um, pets, so dogs in, in the home, for example, um, patients notice that potentially if, if the um, dog licks their hand, they will get hives. So what is that? That's a skin manifestation of the same allergy, which will then drive their asthma to get worse when they're, they're exposed to that pet. So the manifestation of the allergy can come out in the nose, in the lungs, in the skin, in the GI tract sometimes if it's food allergy, um, but the underlying mechanism is all the same. Thank you, thank you for that. How about um, hypoallergenic dogs? Do they exist? Are some breeds perhaps better than others? I see you smiling, Dr. Kowalski. <laughs> so there was, there was actually a pretty nice, um, so there have been studies on this and there was a reasonably good size study um, evaluating homes in which either quote unquote hypoallergenic dogs like Labradoodle is one example, um, or plain regular dogs uh, were in the home. And there was a fair amount, it was over a hundred of each type. So two different arms of this study. Um, and they looked to see if um, there was increased uh, antigens in, in the uh, regular dogs versus the, um, versus the dogs which <clears throat> are hypoallergenic. So they didn't just look at the dogs themselves, but they actually looked at the dust collected in the homes and, the, and you know, the, the, the places where the dogs may sit and the air and everything else. And what was found is that actually the, the hypoallergenic dogs had actually more antigen <laughs> than, than the regular dogs. So, so that phenomenon, unfortunately, is, is, is wonderful, but there's a wide variety and there's a wide range of the dogs, right? So some dogs tend to be just inherited. For some reason, they're more antigenic and people have more symptoms around them. And, and some are not. 
but there's no specific way to figure out which those dogs are and who the person is who's going to tolerate them. So when people tell me I really want to get a dog and I'm super allergic to dogs, um, I tell them not to. And if they still really want to do that, the, the best thing to do is to expose yourself and expose yourself over time. And especially if you have asthma. So visit that pet, put your face in it like over and over because the way that these pets um, drive asthma is not immediate. So if you go into a home and then you come out quickly, you may get nothing. But if you're at the home, you start to feel allergies, you leave. That, that exposure will then what it's called the delayed response. So I don't know, six, eight hours later, you're going to start to feel worse with your asthma. Um, so it's really important, I think, to expose yourself to things that you want to expose yourself to chronically, because you don't want to be in a spot where you buy a cute puppy that's hypoallergenic that drives your allergies crazy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Pavelski. And we have a question. I'll open up to, to either of our two doctors. What other specialties do you team up with to treat these patients? Perhaps ENT, perhaps GI? Okay, so I, I will take this one. Um, so there are types of asthma which um, come with, with some special circumstances. So uh, I'll give you an example. One is called aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. So these patients who are sensitive to aspirin, they have a mechanism that makes them more likely to react to aspirin. It's not, we don't ca call it classic allergy, but it's a mechanism. And that mechanism is affecting not just their lungs, but also their potentially their skin, but especially their nose. So those patients tend to get polyps. Um, so ENTs are instrumental, for example, in, in those cases they will help manage the polyps and then we will help manage the polyps and the asthma, possibly with aspirin desensitization, which is an older mechanism, but actually quite effective in reducing the rate of recurrence or putting them on the newer biologic agents, which I think we'll get to in a little bit, which can also significantly mitigate the polyp regrowth, but also potentially the, the asthma flares. Thank you for that. Um, the next question that we have up, how do patients know when to seek help from a specialist versus just working with their primary care doctor? And how do you know what type of specialist to look for? I, um, I think that you have to understand whether your asthma is uncontrolled or not. So um, if you are, if you're having uh, yeah. night, if you're having symptoms more than twice a week that require you to use albuterol, you're waking up more than yeah. twice a night, or you are having um, symptoms that require you to um, fill more than two of those rescue inhalers a year, then your asthma is likely uncontrolled. And you really need to be, uh, you need to really seek some care from um, a provider. Now, who that provider should be. If you have a really good primary care provider, you should have a conversation with them. You should say, my asthma is very uncontrolled. What is the solution that we can come up with together? If they're, if they, and you could also ask them at that point, should you go ahead and have a referral? Um, if you're highly allergic, probably allergy is more appropriate if they're going to be managing the allergies uh, and the asthma. But pulmonary physicians also manage asthma, and we work pretty closely with allergies. So if you end up seeing a pulmonologist first, then you can get referred after that. And I'll let Latasha comment because she's had to navigate the system. So I'll let, I'm curious to know what her answer is to this particular question, too. Okay, perfect. You're absolutely right. I have seen an allergist specialist and the allergist started me on allergy injections. I did those for about six months, which did, did help. I was always congested. My nose, I was blowing constantly. My eyes was running. I did allergy testing. And so they did find out that I did have a lot of um, like dust, um, pollen, things that I was allergic to grass. And so I do see both. I was, uh, I'm on Singulair, you know, a different, um, and Zyrtec, a few different um, allergy medications. And so they did work hand in hand because I've had allergies for a long time. And then also to piggyback, 
before allergies, I had eczema because my skin was really dry, felly and scaly, and I was on eczema medicine. And after eczema, I had allergies. And then after allergies, I had asthma. So I also see an allergist and they help a lot. I see a pulmonologist and then Dr. Lagogo referred me to uh, ENT. And all three of them working together has really, really been a great help with my care. Thank you so much for that perspective, Latasha. The, the, the next questions, we're going to be focusing a little bit more on allergies, related specialties, treatments. Let's kick off with this question here. What are the treatments for asthma and what are biologics? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, I would like Majira also to join in on this, but I'll start it. Um, so for allergies, uh, the mainstay, so when we talk about allergies, I'm mostly talking about seasonal and perennial allergies that we get in our eyes and nose. Let's talk, it's called allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. So um, for those types of allergies, uh, there's actually quite effective treatments. Um, the first line is usually what's called a nasal steroid. So something that you put into your nose that's steroid based, um, you spray it once or twice a day, depending on your dose. Um, that will decrease the, the local inflammation that allergies cause. Um, it may also prevent you from getting sinus infections or feeling like you might have sinusitis. And it may also help if you have a component of um, the, the nasal stuff bothering your ears. So sometimes there's a, a backlog of, of, um, of pressure into the ears when you have severe allergies. So nasal steroids are, are pretty, one of the mainstays of therapy. Um, after that, um, the second or, or in conjunction with, we use oral antihistamines and Latasha actually mentioned one of them called Zyrtec, but there's also, that's the name brand, but there's also Allegra, there's also Claritin, there's, there's different ones. Um, and they all have some difference in the way they work or potentially have side effects, but I won't get into. <laughs> um, but those are the next step. Um, so what do they do? So they, they help dry you up a little bit more than the nasal steroids. They also will not just act locally, but potentially, like let's say you get itchy skin as part of your allergies. Um, so they will definitely help with that. Um, they're not really considered asthma medications because they really don't affect asthma too much um, in the sense of improving your overall asthma symptoms. They might improve your allergies. And if that's a big driver for your asthma, maybe a little bit, they would help. Um, there's also others. Uh, Singular is another one that Latasha mentioned um, that works a little bit differently. It's, um, it works kind of on the cascade of what happens when you have significant um, allergies and asthma, um, and more for de what's called the delayed response rather than the immediate response that we see with antihistamines. Like if you get hives and you take Benadryl, it just gets better quickly. And then um, nasal uh, rinses are pretty important, especially in allergy seasons, because you can uh, kind of uh, wash out some of the antigens um, if you're outside playing golf and it's uh, grass season, for example. Um, and those are the main, I, I mean, immunotherapy, so allergy shots are sort of the end stage um, that, that Latasha also mentioned. Um, those are for, for um, patients who have more significant symptoms, have more than one, it's not maybe not just rhinitis, but also their eyes, but also their lungs. Um, and those are a, a big commitment, and, and those are usually done with an allergist. There's both uh, injectable forms which will provide coverage for many different allergies, or there's oral forms, which are typically for one allergy. So if you have a predominant type of allergy, um, but these are all things that with an allergist, you can potentially consider. I wanna mention one thing about allergy immunotherapy and asthma, and that is that if the asthma is more than, if it's not well controlled, or it's kind of in that severe category where it's not managed yet well, um, we do not like to start patients on them because um, they kind of rev your immune system up towards the allergen a little bit, especially at the buildup phase or the beginning. Um, and they can actually contribute to worsening asthma at the start. So we only do that when your asthma is very well managed um, for the allergy immunotherapy. I'm going to have Najira do the, the asthma medications. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. So, um, 
the the mainstay of asthma treatment is inhaled steroids. And um, it comes in an inhaler. Um, you have to be sure you know what you're doing with your inhalers because it turns out if you don't use it properly, it's going to go to the back of your throat and you'll swallow most of it and get very little in your lungs, which kind of, uh, um, you know, makes it ineffective. So you want to really know that you have a high level of confidence that you know how you're using your medications. So we normally start with steroids to deal with inflammation, but asthma is a condition where you have inflammation and you also have constriction or tightening of those bronchial tubes, in which case you need medications we call bronchodilators. Those open up your bronchial tubes. And um, they are short acting bronchodilators. Those are the ones patients have become very used to carrying around and actually using those too much can be dangerous. We'll talk more about that if a question comes up to that uh, regarding that issue. And then there are the long acting ones that last about 12 hours. There's also another medication uh, that prevents the bronchial tubes from squeezing down. And that's another class of medications. And more recently, we have what we call triple inhalers, which basically have your inhaled steroid, your long acting bronchodilator and the medication to prevent constriction all in one inhaler. Um, I wanna say that it's a very, very exciting time to be a, an asthma doctor because in the last seven years, we have had, I believe five new biologic drugs approved for asthma. So what's a biologic drug? A biologic drug, many of you actually, unfortunately, because of COVID, have probably heard of monoclonal antibodies now, which were being used to treat people that had COVID. So many of us have heard that term quite a bit. So a monoclonal antibody or a biologic is a, uh, a drug where they, they create something in a lab, it's a medication that attaches to a particular protein that's causing inflammation. And so in the case of asthma, there are some that are meant to attach to a protein called IL-5 and get rid of eosinophils. And I had mentioned eosinophils can make asthma worse. So in people with eosinophilic asthma, you can use that drug. There's one that attaches to something called IL-4 and it reduces uh, inflammation. It reduces both the allergic responses and makes eosinophils incapable of getting into lung tissue. And then there's a new one that just got approved in December of 2021 that goes higher up and blocks both allergic pathways and eosinophilic pathways. And also people who don't have that kind of asthma, this is a really new mechanism for people who don't have allergic or eosinophilic asthma, the asthma Dr. Kowalski was referring to as type two asthma. And then lastly, our oldest biologic targets what we call IgE, which is very critical in allergic responses and that medicine has been around for nearly 20 years, more than 20 years, and it's actually safe in pregnancy as well. So we do have a lot of good options for people who have already taken all the inhalers and they are just not well controlled, continuing to have flares or requiring prednisone tablets every day to control their asthma. Thank you so much, both of you, for those answers. The, the next question that we have up are steroids not a good long-term treatment for allergy and asthma patients? And if so, why? Well, if we are talking about oral steroids, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, oral steroids can accumulate, uh, the effects of oral steroids can accumulate pretty quickly. And there was a study published in 2018 that actually uh, really changed my thinking about oral steroids because it turns out that if you take people who've never had steroids and have asthma and you follow them for eight years, in this case, they looked in a database in the UK, they found that depending on how much steroid these patients then got over the years compared to those who didn't get steroids, people started to develop a lot of other medical conditions. And the threshold where you started to see that harm was pretty low, actually. It was equivalent to 1,000 milligrams of oral steroids, which is really only four short courses of prednisone in your entire lifetime over that eight-year period. And many of our patients are getting that in one year. And what happens to you is that you start to develop diabetes, obesity, heart disease. You can get strokes. 
and other cardiovascular problems. You can develop cataracts and other uh, conditions that are lifelong conditions. And so you really want to avoid those oral steroids as much as you can. That being said, they are life-saving medication. So when you're very ill with asthma and you have an acute episode and you're in the hospital, emergency room, doctor's office, these drugs do work quite well, but you have to understand that they are risky if you use too much of it or if you use it too long. And I think I would like Latasha to comment on the oral steroids as well, give us a patient perspective on it and also on the biologics, which you know she's had to take so I'm sure people are curious, how does it feel as a patient to have to take biologics? What did that mean for you? And um, also the issue of oral steroids, which I know patients are very passionate about. Thank you. Um, yes, I have been on a lot of oral steroids, which is prednisone. It has a horrible taste, but I got used to taking it. Prednisone, I've noticed it did raise my blood sugar. And so whenever I'm on prednisone, I have to take metformin to counteract to bring my blood sugar down. And so I'm often on both of those. And also while I'm on steroids, I had to do a bone density test to make sure my bones was not getting brittle. And since I've been on quite a bit of steroids, I do a lot of bruising. Steroids, if I walk by something or hit my leg or my arm out, my body bruised really easily with steroids. So that's one of the things that I don't like about steroids. But as far as the biologics that I'm on now, I tried one that was Nutella. We did that one for a while. We wasn't getting the results that we really wanted. And so I've switched over to two other biologics. They're going good. You just have to get used to it. I had a great team working with me in Dr. Legogo's office, her nursing staff, how they had to teach me how to do injections myself. One of my biologics, I inject every 14 days. And I, the other biologic that I'm doing is every two months now. And so they're doing good. It's just, you just have to get used to it and reassure yourself that you can do it. And it really doesn't hurt once you get used to it. And they give you a great, great learning tip and they make sure that you are comfortable with it. And also while you're taking biologics or any other medications, you'll carry an EpiPen with you at all times, just in case you have an allergic reaction to anything, but it helps, it does. Thank you. Thank you, it's so valuable to get your perspective, Latasha, it really is. Um, and it's great that these medications help but treatment costs can add up. How did you navigate insurance and payment for the medications and treatments for your asthma? And do you have any advice for, for others? Yes, that is a great, great question. You have to be your own advocate and you have to have a great team because it's very, very expensive. And sometimes insurance fights you and they deny it and you have to keep reappealing and from the doctor's office, Dr. Logo office, like I said, their team was really good because there was avenues out there that I didn't know about. Some of my biologics were like $4,000 and $3,000. And it's something that I needed to stay alive and they were denying me. And so there's different prescription programs that they'll have Dr. Logo submit it and they had me fill out and they'll go by your income and it was covered 100%. So I did not have to come out of pocket at all, which was a true blessing because there was no way that I would ever be able to afford all the medication that I was on. Thank May you. I just Thank a you. Comment of course you can, Dr. Kowalski. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so I just, um, I just wanted to comment on the use of two biologic agents at the same time. So um, Latasha has a, a, has a very significant um, asthma history, as, as you've heard. Um, and in those cases, um, I have some patients on two biologics, and so does Dr. Lugogo. Um, I will say that that's not the majority of patients who are on biologics. So I don't want to um, give the impression that uh, severe asthmatics need two different biologic agents, because they usually don't. Um, usually if they have severe asthma and you can figure out a mechanism and you want to get them off of steroids, we start with one. Now, how do we decide which one to start with? That, that's a very difficult question because while we have a lot of different ways of, of 
thinking about it and measuring, uh, we don't always know the, the right one. And so sometimes we will go with our gut instinct and pick one. And just like with Latasha, the Nukala didn't seem to help her, but the other ones did. And so the other big thing I, I would like patients to know about biologics is that one, it's typically one and not two, um, and, they, and they do help usually. But the second is that because we don't have a, a very clear mechanism of always picking the right one at the first, it's okay to, to try one and then take some time and then pick, try another one. Um, and it's okay for to advocate for that. So uh, sometimes what I've noticed is that um, probably um, in academic centers, we're a little bit more um, used to this, um, but advocate for that even if you're not in an academic center and say, could we try a different one if you don't feel like the first one worked? Thank you. I think that's an important um, that's an important thing to to mention. Um, let's move on to our our next mini topic, which is uh, flare ups. How do you know when you need to get to the hospital when your asthma flares up? People tend to wait too long or drive themselves. Latasha, I know you mentioned that earlier on. Should people treat it like a heart attack and advocate to be a uh, priority in the ER, for example? I see you nodding there, Dr. Lagogo. Yeah, this is this is my passion topic. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think we've done a disservice to people by normalizing asthma attacks. We've made it feel like, well, this is just how it is. You should accept it. This is your life. You're going to have an attack. And, uh, and that's what Latasha was describing. You know, you say, I'll just take a nebulizer. I'll go take a warm shower. The air is gonna help me breathe better. And in so doing, sometimes you miss the, uh, the severity of it. So I think that um, when you develop symptoms, like you, sometimes it's just that you can't stop coughing. Sometimes you feel very tight. You feel like you can't get air in or you're wheezing very loudly, anytime you're in distress and you've used the tools your doctor has given you, like an inhaler or a nebulizer machine, and you're not getting better, you, you should err on the side of caution. And we need to start thinking about asthma attacks the way we think about an, a heart attack, like you mentioned. You know, Nobody would tell somebody, if you start having chest pain going down your arm and you think you have a heart attack, go lie down for 35 minutes and then take a hot shower. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. We always educate patients, get there. And many times they're not having a heart attack, but when they are, they get there in time. And if we are to really completely eliminate deaths related to asthma, which is always the goal, we need to start allowing people to go in and get care. There may be times you get there and they tell you you're okay. And maybe you are okay. And there may be times that you're not okay. Now, the people who really get a little bit um, in trouble are those who go to the ER and or urgent care or other emergent uh, places to get care. And they aren't wheezing because a lot of people think you have to wheeze to have asthma. And I think Latasha was describing that, that a quiet chest in somebody with asthma is actually probably more concerning than a wheezing chest. Because when you're wheezing, you're still moving some air to make that sound. But when your chest gets quiet, it means that you aren't moving as much air at all. So if you're in distress and you're coughing uncontrollably, or you, you're, you're so tight you can't even wheeze, those are critical opportunities to really say, you know, can you please just listen to my chest? I feel very tight and I'm having a lot of symptoms. If you happen to have a peak flow meter at home, you can take a quick measure of your own lung function and see where you are. But if in doubt, go in, call in, get evaluated, because you, you know what Latasha was describing is driving to the ER and people saying, oh my goodness, did you drive here? Because it's pretty scary when you show up and you're in distress and yet you were driving a car five minutes before you showed up so I think people should start taking it much more seriously for sure. 
No, and I think that's really fantastic uh, of you, Dr. Legogo. Uh, you know, I've done live streams with stroke specialists, with, with heart specialists, and they all say, you know, if in doubt, come in. So I think it's really important, this point that you're making. And I'd love, Latasha, I'd love your perspective on this too. What would you tell someone having a flare up? What should they do when perhaps to go to the hospital and perhaps not to end up in the ICU? I'd love to hear your perspective too. If I can help anyone, I would tell them, please don't try the things that I've tried. I would feel myself not feeling 100% and I would take my peak flow, like Dr. Lagogo said at home, I can measure and see how much air I'm getting. And so I will say, okay, I can manage it. So I have a nebulizer. I'll up my dual nibs. I'll take them like every four hours. And then if I, and then I'll say, okay, I'll take a hot shower or I'll go outside for air. And none of those things are helping at all. And they're not even good to try and do yourself. And so I'll go, I have, like I said, I have drove myself to the ER because I can hear myself wheeze. And then when I stop hearing myself wheeze and my test is feeling real tight, like something is just laying on your chest. Just like you can't take a deep breath in or you can't take one breathe out. If I can't breathe in and out, I know that I need to be seen right away. And when I get to the ER and they'll, they'll now they know my case, they see me come in, they're great. They'll have my paperwork. They take me right in. They'll listen to me right away. I don't have to sit in the waiting room. I don't have to wait in the back. They'll listen to me and start working on me right then. When I get there, I'm on, usually I'm on continue nibs and I'm on BiPAP. They'll continue to do treatments until I can open up until they can hear air. They have to be able to hear airflow before they can even admit me or before they put me in a room, they have to hear airflow. And so my thing is, I will stress to anyone that has asthma, please do not try to self-medicate yourself. Don't try to work on it at home. If you are in distress, you're not able to talk. You're not able to complete a full sentence. You're not able to take a deep breath in or out. You're in trouble. Thank you so much for that, Latasha. That's very powerful and I'm sure very helpful to people on this too. The next question that we have with regards to flare up, can asthma be cured? <laughs> That's a tricky one. Um, you know, I, I would say that in general, we can't cure asthma. Although there are circumstances for uh, which when people get asthma in childhood, they can quote outgrow their asthma. So there are people who have asthma in childhood and then as they mature into young adulthood, they have complete resolution or remission of their asthma. We still don't call it a cure because even in some of those people decades later, it may just start back up all of a sudden. And so I don't feel like we have any good tools to cure asthma. We are getting a lot smarter about the mechanisms that drive asthma. And in the future, we may be able to give medications or alter the immune system in a way that makes it stop responding the way it's responding. And I guess the closest thing I could imagine to accomplishing that is perhaps in a very allergic person who gets shots and over time becomes tolerant to the things that are driving their asthma, that may be really the only situation where you can adjust how your immune system is responding and have a chance to get at it. But I, I think that um, you can achieve remission of asthma. I'm not so sure that we can cure asthma, but we certainly, that's an aspirational dream to cure asthma. And um, we have an opportunity in young children to prevent asthma. So there is something called the atopic march, which I let Dr. Kowalski talk about, where you can pick out people who are marching in the direction of developing asthma. And maybe if you shut down those abnormal immune responses early, you might prevent those people from developing asthma. And then you won't have to worry about curing it because they won't ever start at the beginning. So these are the goals we want to to aspire to. And that's why we constantly are researching new treatments and new approaches. But I'm gonna let Dr. Kowalski comment on this as well. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, 
in children who have allergies, um, there have been multiple studies and, and uh, retrospective reviews that if um, they start immunotherapy for their allergies before they develop asthma, it often prevents them from developing asthma in the first place. So this is especially true for um, the perennial allergens, so things that are in the home all the time. So dust mite, cockroach, mold, um, and, and pets. Uh, but it can also be, there, there could be a component of seasonal as well. Um, and so the typical age where most people feel comfortable starting a child on immunotherapy is around five or above. So when the children are very young, um, they can't voice things after their injections often. So they can't say, oh, I feel really strange or I'm not feeling well. You need to be able to do that because immunotherapy can cause allergic reactions itself. Um, and so uh, typically we start at five or above. And some of the, so the subcutaneous immunotherapy we can do, but there are some, some of the um, pill forms also are down to the age of five, which are, grass and ragweed. Um, for dust mite, we don't have that yet. Um, so it's 18 and up. Um, but by doing this, it actually prevents um, the asthma from developing in the first place. And it's incredibly powerful uh, for that reason. Um, the same thing about allergy in general. So if you are able, the reason that immunotherapy has been around for over 100 years um, is that it's the only thing that will reliably potentially cure you of something that's in the allergy realm. Um, meaning if you are on it long enough and you have a good response to it, it's, it's possible that once you stop the immunotherapy and we do that typically for three to five years, your allergies may never come back. The other thing that immunotherapy does in children uh, besides uh, limiting the asthma development is limiting other allergy development. So let's say you're on dust mite immunotherapy, you may never get to a point where you start becoming allergic to trees and grasses and other things, which may have occurred if you weren't on allergy immunotherapy. So I guess that's a good plug for us, huh? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of um, things that you have to think about when you're doing immunotherapy and you have to be under the care of a person and you, uh, an, an allergist who's board certified and you have to be in the, um, in the office for half an hour after injections because yes, anaphylaxis occurs from immunotherapy. But despite all of that, um, it's a really powerful tool. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Kowalski. Let's move on to triggers. Let's touch on a few more triggers for asthma. This question here, what impact does the flu, a cold, or especially relevant now COVID, have on an asthma patient? Um, you know, viruses are particularly notorious at causing um, asthma exacerbations. Now, not everybody is as susceptible to it, but um, viruses, and there are some viruses that are more likely to propagate inflammation in the lungs and cause people's asthma to worsen than others. One interesting fact about COVID is that in fact, it doesn't seem to cause the asthma to flare per se. It seems to be a disease of mostly the lung tissue itself where people get pneumonia in the most severe cases. Um, we, the data on whether people with asthma have worse outcomes with COVID is a little bit murky. What we know though, is that people with this kind of type two asthma may actually have better outcomes when if they get exposed to COVID, similarly to uh, individuals who don't have lung disease than those who don't have this kind of type two inflammation. Um, the jury, um, I guess, is still out on whether asthma increases your risk, but it certainly is listed as a, um, a factor that increases your risk of having more poor outcomes with COVID. And it is one of the things that um, they list in the CDC when they're recommending that you should get vaccinated for COVID. It also is one of the factors that's taken into consideration to make you a candidate for antiviral treatments for COVID, which are now available, but you need to be diagnosed and treated within five days. So if you're suspicious you have COVID, you need to get tested pretty quickly. 
Now, um, I know Latasha had some very salient comments about this very specific issue and the impact of viruses, colds, and flu on her asthma. Um, I think it is pretty important to know that you can get in trouble when you get viral illnesses. And so you really need to pay attention to it, particularly when it quote, goes down into your chest. So if it's all sinus drainage and congestion, that's different. But if you start feeling respiratory symptoms, you really should pay it attention. I'll let her comment as well. Thank you. Um, last Wednesday, I was feeling like I was coming down with a cold. And so I was like, you know what? I'm not breathing my best. I'll go ahead and get checked. So I went to the ER. And they wasn't hearing a lot of airflow. I was checked. They swapped me for the flu and COVID. And the flu, influenza flu A came back positive. And so that's exactly what went and put me in distress because of the flu. And so I've noticed with myself, I have to know my body. And so if I come down with a bad cold, and like Dr. Lagogo said, and I'm coughing or it's in my chest. I have to get on top of things. And I, when um, you were saying triggers, you have to know certain triggers. A cold is my trigger for asthma. I have to be careful so I don't get pneumonia with that. Also, another trigger is weather. Some people don't have that trigger, but it's one of my triggers. If it's too muggy or really hot, like 98 degrees and muggy, that's one of my triggers. If it's really, really cold outside, I have to make sure that I'm covered my nose and mouth. That's another trigger. I just have to learn my body and my asthma and how to control it because there are certain triggers. Another trigger for me is really strong, strong fumes like bleach or ammonia. I can't stand to be around very strong fumes. Those are triggers for me. So once you really get to know how to handle your own body and your own care and your own asthma, you'll get better control because you'll avoid those triggers or you'll try and do whatever it takes to take care of yourself if you have to be in those. Like I couldn't avoid the flu. I don't know where I got the flu from. I couldn't avoid it. But once it did trigger me, I knew what to do to get right on it. Thank you so much, Latasha. Again, really, really important to have your perspective on these things. Um, with regards to triggers, Dr. Kowalski, can you tell us about aspirin-sensitive asthma? Yes. Um, so there's, um, there's an enzyme that aspirin blocks. And by blocking that enzyme, some people have shunting of what they produce as a result of it. Um, and if they produce what's called too much leukotrienes, um, they end up developing um, symptoms of a, a few different symptoms. So one of them is usually runny nose and congestion, um, sneezing. Another one is tightness and wheezing. So, you know, asthmatic attacks. And uh, I've had patients who didn't even realize um, they, they had this problem until they got the back pain and they took 800 milligrams of Motrin, which is not that uncommon to do. 200 is the normal dose or Advil and they, and they just took a few more um, and then had to end it up in the ER with, with an asthma attack. So the way that, that it's interesting that, that entity. So the way that it's um, managed and, and typically people have eventually they may not have it right away, but eventually they might develop polyps or they might develop a, a bad, like no sense of smell. That's when the, the ear, nose and throat doctors also get involved. Um, but they may not be aware of this until it happens to them. They might have milder symptoms with smaller doses because it's very dose dependent too. So that's the other thing to keep in mind. Uh, it's often around 120, 200 milligrams that you would notice with, with uh, aspirin, you may not notice if you take a baby, like 81 milligram aspirin, that you actually have this problem. So sometimes it's a little bit difficult to diagnose as well. The way that um, these things are helped is usually by avoiding um, the trigger, which is any, any type of NSAID. So that means aspirin, ibuprofen, um, Aleve, uh, so different varieties. Uh, Tylenol is usually okay. And some people that are very sensitive, very high dose of Tylenol can even bother them. Um, and then uh, taking medications that may help. So 
the singular is a leukotriene antagonist. We talked about it earlier. That could, that's one drug that can be helpful with this entity. Um, there's some other ones like it. There's one called Zyflo that can be helpful. Um, and if you were to have your polyps removed and then um, you would see an allergist afterwards, being slowly given aspirin in the office over multiple days can make you tolerant of it. And strangely enough, being on a high dose of aspirin can kind of reorganize this cascade for you where you are not sensitized anymore if you take it regularly. So that's actually one of the therapies for it. It works very well for polyp regrowth. For, for managing asthma, it doesn't work that well. Um, it, it can make it a little bit less likely to get worse or have flares, but, it, but it, you would still need to be on a good asthma regimen because aspirin alone will not fully treat your um, asthma if you have aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. One of the new biologic agents um, is, is helpful in this regard, very helpful. There are others that are also partially helpful. Actually, you can use um, the Dupixent is one. You can sometimes use the anti-IL-5s like Nucala um, or Fasenra. Um, even Zolaire can actually be helpful in this. So the anti-IL-5s, though this is a specific entity um, and, and the, the anti-IgE and the anti-IL-4 and 13, those are different ways those work, um, can be helpful in aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Kowalski. Um, you know, this time has swept by and we have a lot of questions, but let's wrap up and talk about how important it is to advocate for good asthma care. First up, Dr. Legogo, why do so many asthma patients seem to just accept and live with the symptoms and poor quality of life that asthma provides versus seeking help? What would you say to these people? I think that comes from um, a some a lot of asthma patients come from families where there are multiple people with asthma, and they've become quite used to it. You know, you've seen your grandmother wheezing and coughing all the time, and then your mother was doing it, and 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 it just is what it is. You know, or you were diagnosed with asthma twenty five years, thirty years ago in childhood, and you assume that, well, they must be giving me all the medications that are available without realizing that there's been tremendous progress that has been made. Um, I think asthma patients are very resilient. They are very tough patients. They push through it. Um, over time, they just resign themselves to it. And then they start reorganizing their lives around their asthma. Like I'm not going to do any physical activities. I'm not going to visit anyone um, because of my breathing. And so what I want to tell my asthma patients is that you deserve better. You should demand better. As providers, we should work with you so that your asthma doesn't hold you back, that you can just completely do the things you want to do. And you should have an expectation that that is the way it should be because we have really, really good tools now to help us accomplish that. And just like a diabetic, you wouldn't say, well, your sugar is 300, just live with it. It is what it is. I want my asthma patients to be similar to the diabetes patients who say, no, I'm not going to live with this the way it is. I don't want to get all these steroids that are going to hurt me. I want a solution. And if the person taking care of you says, well, I don't know what else to do, then ask them to refer you to somebody who might have some new options for you because we are always learning, we are always doing new treatments and you deserve better. And you, you know, I have a large, large number of people on biologics and many of them um, have told stories of how they've been able to recover that quality of life and play with their grandchildren or laugh at a joke without coughing. Can you imagine always being conscious of coughing, particularly during a pandemic? People are very terrified of coughing. You can reclaim all those little things you, you just completely take for granted. You just have to know that you, you deserve better, demand better, expect better, and take control of your asthma. And there are solutions out there for you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Lagogo. I would love to give the final question to you, Latasha. What would you tell patients who have perhaps resigned themselves to living with severe asthma? You can live with severe asthma. 
like Dr. Lagogo was saying, take control of your health, get on the right medications, seek, the main thing is seek the right doctor. I've been to more than two doctors. You have to make sure someone is there to advocate and fight with you. As long as you have a good team fighting with you, you can do it and you will make it. You will overcome it. It may not be gone, but it will be under control. You can live a great life. Latasha, thank you so much. This has been such a quick hour and I'd like to, to thank you for, for this different perspective that you offer. Thank you for the time that you've taken out to answer these questions. Obviously, our expert panel, Dr. Lagogo, Dr. Kowalski, you guys were fantastic too. And thank you very much to our viewers as well for, for the questions rolling in and we will have this up in its entirety on our YouTube channel. I have a feeling we'll probably be scheduling another one of these because we have a lot more questions to tackle, but thank you all three. Thank you.